Train by day, Kyle Wigginton podcast by night, all day. GoPro that I had that barely shoots like 720. Mm-hmm. But, They're indestructible though, eh? Oh my God, it works. It works so good. <laughs> so Jonah. Yes, sir. Monet. That's correct. Jonah Monet. Okay. So tell us about yourself, Jonah Monet. What would you like to know, Kyle? Like, Jonah, how did we first meet? We met on one of, uh, it was a gun commercial, right? Oh, God, yes, yes. Um, I was on, uh, I was a producer for Trigger Time TV. I did a few um, um, of the episodes as well. And we had a camera operator named Jared, who is a lovely individual, love him to death. And he, after he wrapped that season, he started calling me to do commercials and such. And I think we met on one was a film industry permit commercial and the other was a gun industry commercial. Yeah. What, did, what was trigger time? Trigger time TV is where you basically take all the special special forces guys in the world, um, from every country, the best of the best. And then you take all of the equipment, the latest equipment, and you marry the two and they teach you how to do, uh, whatever technique it is, whether it's clearing, team clearing houses, team clearing buildings, uh, in terrorist situations, or just regular basic stuff like how to shoot prone patty. If you're, um, a sniper per se, um, we, they, we would also try to, uh, verify, uh, the fire industry's claims on their items, such as Glock. Okay. Everybody claims Glock is Glock. It's great. But is it really? Well, we tried to melt down every firearm that we could find. And, uh, Glock was the only one we couldn't melt down. So I love that you just said a lot of words, but what she really tried to say was <laughs> they take a beautiful woman and they put a gun in her hands and dudes watch the show. Yes. That's, yes. That's what trigger time really is. It really is. Uh, Tatiana Whitlock is a machine, but the wonderful thing about trigger time TV is it's not just gun bunnies. The women on trigger time TV are actually tactically trained mostly mm-hmm. by special forces guys. We've had a huge background of combatives as well with Muay Thai striking, uh, combats, uh, submission hold combats, BJJ. Um, so they're, they're the real deal. It's not just beautiful show. Well, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that have beautiful faces, but also have skills with it too. And that's, yes. uh, that's, that's what this uh, show is all about. But yeah, that's how Jonah and I met. And I think the, what, what was the gun? The gun was freaking sweet that we uh, did the commercial for. <laughs> Was it a, a PWS AR maybe? Yeah, I don't even know what that means. Yeah, PWS is a company. Uh, they're in Northwest, and they they put out really good American-made ARs at a fair price. And that was the original AR that I actually learned to shoot on. Yeah, I, lo- I love uh, – I'm a, I'm a huge gun guy. Are you? Yeah, it's and the reason I am that way is because I was raised with them in my hands. You know, I find that a lot of people that are against, the, um, against guns and everything, they never they're, – they're scared of them because they never were trained on them. Absolutely. But at a very young age, being from Arkansas, you know, my parents have guns and we have guns in our hands from day one. That's fantastic, actually. And, and it's imperative that people are trained. And, and a lot of people, you know, there's this big doomsday thing going on into the world, preppers. And one of the biggest things is people start hoarding guns and ammunition. Mm-hmm. And the fact of the matter is none of that's going to do any good unless you've had specialized training um, and you are comfortable enough to actually use a firearm. Another truth is sadly that there's a lot of people that are trained, but they don't have that ability to become unbuckled from social dictate to not actually injure another person if it really comes down to it. So there's a whole intellectual aspect of it as well. No, that makes a lot of sense too. Yeah. The, um, just letting the animal out, I guess. Absolutely. And you, you, you were just kind of raised into that, which is such a huge blessing. Uh, not everybody has that luxury and opportunity and, um, that their parents trust their kids enough in order to say, Hey, let's, this is going to be part of our life and, um, give you that experience and extend that trust because it is a trust. But just like you said, most people that are afraid of guns, they've never shot one. They don't understand it. Yeah. It'd be the equivalent of somebody saying, here, Jonah, go hop in this helicopter and go fly it. <laughs> right. You, it's, it's scary. It's devastating. And you're not going to trust helicopter pilots unless you kind of understand how to 
fly a helicopter yourself Mm -hmm. to some small, even if it's to a small degree, every little bit of education helps. It all stacks, right? Yeah. And I have a buddy from, uh, from San Francisco and he was telling me how bad guns were. And I was like, Hey man, have you ever shot one? And he's like, well, no, I've never shot one. And I was like, how the fuck do you know that they're bad? If you've never had one in your hands, right? You never shot one, then you can't say this. Right. Like, no opinion. Yeah, yeah, it's a sad truth. It's a lack of education, just like most of our yeah. issues today. Well, and and for me, like, um, my dad didn't teach me because he wanted me to know how to shoot a gun. He taught me because for him that was a thing of survival. Because when he grew up, uh, he grew up in a very very poor family. So I mean, they had to go out and kill what they ate sometimes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I mean, he needed to know that skill to actually survive. So he, it's one of the things he wanted to instill in his kids is just in case. That's that's very crucial. I mean, how many people can um, go out and kill their food? <laughs> kill their food and gut it. And, and then there's also the, the topic of uh, the irresponsibility of deferred um, safety. Cops aren't there to defend you they're there to clean up a mess and document it so that it can go through court so you depending on someone else for your responsibility of safety is the most irrational thing that i could ever especially in today's world today's world and the whole food issue we have a food scarcity that's that's fluctuating um to such a level people are starting to think it's regular but it's actually in my opinion through my studies uh, i was just talking to one of my camera operators this morning about des uh, which is diesel fuel uh diesel uh emission fuel which at, if most trucks the truckers the 18 wheelers after the year of t- 2010 they're required to use this along with their diesel and what it helps do is it's basically helps suppress uh bad emissions and it's made out of fertilizer and distilled water but the problem is uh the railroad company that's the only one responsible for this certain type of um uh fertilizer is not actually being very amicable with our society right now, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they've actually uh, done something with Flying J to where they put a reserve on how much they could actually get. They knocked it down by 50%. And the Flying J... Why are they doing this? Like, what do you think? (laughs) I mean, this is... This This is a rabbit hole. Yeah, what do you think? Can we cuss here? Yeah, why not? Okay, fuck this shit. Yeah. This is a bloody rabbit hole that... How far do you, down you want to go? And really it comes down to what, what standards do I myself want to adhere to as far as my personal honor and what can I actually do about how many of these things that you find out about, can you actually do anything about? And do you want to retain your sanity? Because there's a lot of it you can't do anything about, but yet if people would start actually speaking to each other, because the, the majority of us have a lot of sensibilities. It's not the over, over sensationalized media projecting that we're all these extremes. There's a lot of us that are here in the middle that have sensibilities, but we're not communicating with each other because, well, social dictate at current is you're fucking crazy if you have any foresight or pattern recognition, right? Just trust, trust, just trust. But that, again, comes back to the same conversation that we were just having, Kyle. Deferred responsibility responsibility is um, a recipe for disaster. Yeah, it's a, it's a whole thing of like there are things happening in the world that I can't control. And it's the same with the food stuff. Is like I depend on the food from the supermarket and I can't control if the food's there or not. So I need to have a backup plan just in case. And my backup plan is going out and killing something. Absolutely. And back to the truckers, if the truckers can't deliver the food, there is about to be a large food store shortage. Not only that, most of our wheat comes from uh, Russia and the Ukraine. And as of right now, there's a, 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 a standstill on that. We're at a deadlock with them over that. And the war started after the time period to plant wheat. So it's not like we can go run out and plant wheat here because well, it's too so, late. That's so retarded anyway. War is just so dumb. It is. It is. It's played out. So you're, you're in a position that you go kill something. Well, um, I have actually transitioned my life slowly over a three year period. So it wasn't quite so painful. And I am personally, I started breeding meat rabbits and out of three rabbits, you can get in your freezer over 300 pounds of meat a year, what? just off of three rabbits. Dude, Laura's going to love this. We have a bartender that has pet rabbits. <laughs> I, I joke with her about eating them all the time too. Well, yeah, well, yeah. I, I will impale a rabbit. <laughs> with no problem. Um, and I hunt, I fish. Um, I have gone from saying, okay, instead of waiting till things get so bad 
that nobody can find toilet paper. Let's figure this out so it's not so painful before it gets to that point and just be a little bit more self-reliant. Or just rabbits. Rabbits. Yeah, that's what bears use, I think. Rabbits. Rabbits wipe their ass with rabbits. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I trans I transitioned from trying to have a refrigerator to see if I could live without one, which I am a fresh food, food kind of girl. Is that possible? It, it's possible. After three years of studying and, and transitioning slowly, so it wasn't a nightmare for me. I am now to the point that I don't have to have a refrigerator. I even use, utilize powdered butter, powdered heavy cream, powdered milk. I have freeze dried, uh, vegetables, dehydrated vegetables. I have a dehydrator even, um, I love dehydrating. yeah, it's great. It's really great. Uh, mushrooms are my favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, I love, dry, I love portobello mushrooms. <laughs> I love all kinds of mushrooms. Yeah. Yeah. People know this about me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I'm now to the point, I don't actually have to have refrigeration. Yeah. You still have one though. You just don't have to have, you don't require one. Correct. Correct. That's the smart way to be. I mean, Mm -hmm. the smart way to do is to utilize the tools that we have, Mm -hmm. but always be prepared to be without. Absolutely. And that's where I'm trying to head my life. I actually have a, a four bedroom house in the historic district, which sounds glamorous and it's really not, (laughs) but, um, I'm, It's for sale right now. And I'm actually building a tiny home on a seven foot by 18 foot flatbed trailer. Um, And it's going to be super nice. I'm going to have travertine tile in it and subway tile in the bathroom. Those are really nice nowadays. Yeah. It's it's going to be great. I can't wait for you to see mine. I'm going to build myself a Japanese uh, soaking tub. (laughs) I don't know what that is. I'll let you use it. (laughs) (laughs) Japanese soaking tub. It sounds fun. It is. Um, I was looking for a very large tree for ages. And then uh, I've been in discussion with my next door neighbor about a tree that was half dead. And um, they've been jacking around and didn't cut it down. And during the last hurricane, it came down and wiped out our fence between us, my entire back fence, and my fence between myself and my next neighbor, the tree is as big around as the hood of an F-250 King Ranch mm-hmm. truck. And so I'm, um, I just got a chainsaw. Yeah. I love tools <laughs> and I'm going to carve it into a Japanese soaking tub and it's going to go in my tiny home. Nice. Yeah. 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 I've thought about the tiny home thing too. Like for me, that would be the way to go if I was ever going to leave the situation I'm in right now. Cause right now I'm in a perfect situation, living situation for me. Awesome. Um, it's like a nice, uh, area where I can meditate and stuff. It's got my little gym there. So, I mean, everything that I need is right there with me. Superb. Um, but yeah, the tiny home thing, especially one that's mobile. Absolutely. I like guess the way to go. If, if I ever decide to leave this situation. Yeah. And I, I'm, I love it because, um, it's taken a lot of study, but I've actually figured out how to generate electricity in which the best way to do solar power is. Um, there's lead acid batteries and then there's lithium battery batteries. Mm-hmm. And if you're, if you're in a hurry and you just have the money, there are these all inclusive packages, but you need to know the difference between the two because the lead acid batteries do not last as long and they are less dangerous by the way. Uh, lithium batteries, if they're not stabilized properly, they're, kind of actually dangerous. They go boom. Yeah, they will. Um, but they last longer yeah. and that's the perk. But basically for about the same price, you can get a system in either one. But of course the lead, ad- lead acid battery has how- higher wattage output. But I have figured out how to run an entire tiny home with air conditioning, a small stand up freezer and all my appliances, hot water heater, everything uh, for about $2,200. And that would be the last time I would have to buy anything until seven years later that my lead acid battery. Well, that's the thing too. You got to think about when you're talking about the lithium batteries is like, can you fix a lithium battery if it breaks? No, it's like, no, it's impossible, no. but you can fix a lead acid battery. You can. And most of the lead acid battery, uh, power plants are actually, they use a Marine battery You and you can go up to basically almost anybody's car. If they'll just pretend the world went to hell, right? Right. You could go to to anybody's car or their boat and switch your battery out and be back in business again. And there are millions of batteries, but unless people have gasoline around their cars, it's not going to do them any good. But this is all worst case scenario. Obviously, I'm currently enjoying my life. (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, you know, get away from the doomsday for a second. Jonah actually is a film director and producer. 
Yes. So that's that's one of the reasons I wanted her to come in today, even though she has other this wealth of knowledge about survival stuff, which is amazing. Um, tell us about some of that stuff. I got in the film agent film. Di- uh, how did we? How did we? So you, we met whenever you were doing the commercial, the gun commercial. Yes. And then after that, what was the next thing we did together? Was there? Was it more commercials? Or yeah, was it- yeah, we did more commercials together, and then I was, um, I had just almost wrapped uh, on an 1880s period piece, Civil War period piece, and it was actually shot on the Magnificent Seven movie set. I was out there for over a year filming, and it's a pretty long film. It, can you say the name of it? <laughs> it's called Devil's Hitching Post. Okay. Yes, and it's gritty and it's raw and it's truthful and. Um, there's a lot of ups and downs in it. And, you know, Kyle, there's no new story under the sun, right? Right. Um, they're just told from a different perspective and also a different time frame, different era. Um, so this isn't a new story, but it is told with a, a new twist and a new, um, a new set of characters. And it's really, really gritty. And, when you think you know what's going on five minutes later, you realize you don't know what the hell is going on. Mm -hmm. Neither do the characters, which is great. (laughs) Um, and by the time I, I didn't originally start trying to create this project. It's just that I was in New Orleans. This is, the pot that I was planted in. I loved it, but I was watching all of the talent. I was an actress originally. I was watching all of the talent struggle because it costs a lot of money to be an actor or an actress. Um, You've got to update your controllables every year, which is your headshots, your resumes, your uh, IMDb, uh, your website. Uh, it's just a constant. And you have video auditions now, which cost you anywhere from thirty to a hundred dollars a pop. If you're you, if you've got somebody helping you, um, reading on camera. Um, sorry, I get distracted by trucks, and Kyle gets distracted by butts. Whoa, you can't be telling people that. <laughs> Yeah, we have, we, if, for those of you who don't know the bar, there's a giant window here in front of us. So, I mean, all day long, there's just, you know, beautiful, beautiful people women walking beautiful down the street, people. uh, and these amazing yeah. trucks driving by. So, yeah. yeah. So apologies about the pause. I'm staring at trucks. <laughs> so <laughs> anywho, um, where were we? What was happening? You were, you were talking about the film and acting and how yeah. expensive that is. Yeah. So. So it's really expensive and I'm watching all these actress actors around me struggle. And I had gone to school with them down here in New Orleans and they were, they were amazing, amazing talent and they were hard workers. They dug the trenches. They did their work. They showed up on time. They were very professional. They had great attitudes on set, amazing set etiquette, which is very critical. If you're an actor, you need to pay heavy attention to that Mm -hmm. because if you're not amicable, we don't want you the hell on our set. And this is a small swimming pool. We all speak, all of us producers speak, all of us directors speak. And if you're shitting in the swimming pool, we all have to swim in it and we don't want you in the pool anymore. And it's not that anybody's going around talking about you. Basically someone says, have you worked with so-and-so? Yes. Would you work with them again or not? It's either yes or no. We don't sit there. Very small world. We don't get into detail, but we say yes or no. And then that's the end of it. And we trust each other. Um, and, and we move forward and make decisions like that. So it's, it's, it was just really difficult for me to watch all of this great talent in New Orleans just be overlooked because when the big productions come in, they bring their cast, they bring their crew, and then they sprinkle in locals like salt and pepper so that they can get the tax incentives, mm-hmm. it, which is really sad for a lot of great talent and crew being overlooked. And so I, 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 I saw these five or six great actors struggling and I said, you know what? screw this. If you bring lunch money and you bring wardrobe and you bring a smile on your face, we'll shoot you some real footage and you'll have your real footage. And that will give you the foundation to, you'll have your IMDB credit. You'll have your real, which is a visual resume. And, um, you'll have the experience as well of being on set, blah, blah, blah. So I didn't intentionally become an act, uh, a director. Right. That kind of happened by accident. And it was happening before devil's hitching post because I would wind up on a set, the director would just not be directing or didn't know how. And people that I'd gone to school with would say, Hey, would you read with me and help direct me, pre-direct me? So I was pre-directing TV shows and films before we would actually film them because the director just didn't have it together. Yeah. So here it is with devil's hitching post. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll film you guys. 
And so once people started finding out what I was doing, they were like, Hey, would you do me too? And then I landed the magnificent seven movie set and I realized, okay, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I need to really do this justice. So the story grew. It's actually three stories inter intertwined in one. So, um, back to the Kyle's question, what did we do next? I had shot this film, but there were scenes that I had not shot because I am very anti nudity. Uh, the film has almost no cussing in it, no nudity and no sexuality. And I needed somebody that I could trust to do a love scene with. And so I called Kyle <laughs> Kyle, let's make out on screen. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the next That's thing the we next shot. the next thing we did. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was in, a, in a, a real slave cabin in Baton Rouge heat, the middle of summer. It was one twelve outside. Oh, it was miserable that day. <laughs> yeah, the sweat was dripping. And you can't have any sort of climate control because it messes with the sound. So... I, I don't perspire and I apologize to Kyle. It was so bad. My sticky bra would not stay on. I was sweating. Kyle, I'm sorry if I stink and I don't, I don't have a sense of smell. So he, I said, Kyle, don't worry if you smell. I can't even. I can't. Oh, it was horrible that day. I remember yeah. smelling her all day long. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It wasn't bad. It was, I mean, when you're in that set, in that setting, um, and you have all those people around you. This is what a lot of people don't, don't realize about like sex scenes and stuff is like, there's nothing sexy about it at all. At all. Whenever you're actually there no and offense. you have a mic in front of you. No, I, I get it. <laughs> I, I like to tell people this stuff because they've seen some of the other stuff that I've shot before in the past and they're like, oh my God, it's so hot. And it's like, yeah, but when you're there and there's 20 people around you and there's a mic in your face and there's a camera here and they're like, move to this spot, move to this spot. There's literally nothing sexy yeah. about it at all. Yes. It's just you're, you're there doing a job and then you walk away from it. Absolutely. And that's one thing I love about you, Kyle, is uh, you are probably the most professional actor I've ever worked with. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of people that uh, would hear you say that and be like, really? <laughs> this guy's professional at anything. Like, come on. He is so professional and set. And, you know, it, it's not just, um, it's not just the public that has a misconception about what goes on with love scenes, but a lot of the talent, a lot of people method act. And so oh, wow. they force themselves into a scenario that they wouldn't normally force themselves into, um, in a, in a passionate moment and they're living it. And then they can't exactly draw the line and cut it and walk away because they are method actors. Well, method acting a sex scene is, um, having sex. Yeah. Yeah. And so then after the fact, they're just kind of in shock standing around and, and they, you've already crossed the line for them that you've already crossed the line. So they're like, well, I'm actually attracted to you and we've already made out. So we should date and no, no, do not date your coworkers. Well, and actors are <laughs> fucking nuts too. No offense to it's actors true. out there, but I'm one of you. I get it. I'm well, also nuts. Same, same. Yeah. You have, there's something to be said about coming unglued. And it's the same thing with the firearms to become unbuckled. You go against everything that you were taught your entire life, hide your emotions, hide your feelings, hide how you were. You know, we, uh, most people are walking around with a plastic smile on their face. It's not real. None of it's real what they're projecting to the world because you have to to do that to be successful and also um it keeps you from having to work on yourself as well right right um so it's it's just really it's an interesting thing yeah i think that's what actually led me into acting was um trying to discover about my own emotions because mm -hmm. as growing up like you said it's hide this hide that don't let anyone see how you really feel inside and it's like but i feel this way why like how do I explore this in such a way where it's acceptable? Well, you do it through acting because Absolutely. you're really diving into these emotions. And I remember the first time I came unglued, like wow. it was, it was like such a breakthrough moment for me. And like, even the people on set could see it too, because I was like yeah. crying and I was like, just like snot dripping crying. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was insane. And yeah. I felt like just so exhilarating after it was over with because it was like that release was there. It's a release. Yeah, it was something God, that I was yes. like holding on to my entire life and then it was like gone. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, I think the one of the biggest things that I could tell ever tell an actor is that, you know, without conflict, there is no story. Mm -hmm. And I know that from being a writer. Right. Right. There has to be conflict. It has to be 
man against another man, man against nature, man against animal, man against himself even. But unless that's there, there's no story and it's boring. But you can translate that to being talent. The problem with most actors is they get on screen and they, oh, I got to be perfect and I've got to, and, and they become so up in their head and they're so conscious of how they look and, and what they're going to look like on screen. They try to be pretty. They try to be pretty, which means they try to become perfect. Mm -hmm. And perfect has no conflict. Perfect is boring. Mm -hmm. And if you're struggling as talent, you need to stop trying to be perfect because you're boring. And that's one, we want, you, you know, my polite way as a director to say to talent that you're trying to be perfect and you're boring is I hear you, but I don't feel you. Mm -hmm. Give me more. Let me feel you. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a difficult thing to do to say, I'm going to get on screen and have snot dripping from my nose to the concrete. You and I have both done that. Yeah. And, but you have to drop your ego to do that. You can't come into this industry and be successful with an ego. Yeah, that um, was when I first came in. I was I went from modeling to acting, and they kept telling me they're like, "Oh, you're never going to do this because models can't act." And it's like, "Well, why can't they act?" And it's because of the same reason they're trying to be too pretty on camera. Yes, and, and if you're trying to do these like gritty films and stuff, then you can't be pretty anymore. You, you cannot drop that. You cannot. You and I both had that hurdle to jump. Oh I, yeah, I started. Um, you're beautiful. Yes, yes, you are it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, LA, um, I actually started in New Orleans and then went to LA when I was 19 mm -hmm. and I did well, but I realized I, I'm swimming with sharks and I still need floaties. Right. <laughs> I didn't, I don't, I'm LA is not my favorite place on the planet. Oh, I'm not a fan of LA at all. Yeah. 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 And it's for that reason too, is the, the people that have grown up in the industry there, and it's been handed down to them, you know, through generations. Um, they do treat it just that way. They treat it like, um, like all this fresh meat that's coming in and that end up turning out actors and models that, uh, could have had successful careers, but they just use them up. Isn't that the truth? Um, I've, I've seen the same pattern and I think generally it's an egocentric, uh, industry. Because you think about it, in order to get on screen and be the center of attention, you have to be able to want to be the center of attention, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of talent that couldn't make it. And they said, well, I'll take some extra work as a PA um, or this. And they wind up as crew instead of talent. And they're kind of resentful to the talent that does make it. But, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, people don't realize that it's, it's very difficult in this industry because everyone's trying to, Hey, let me utilize you for a second to level up. Mm -hmm. Right. And so everybody's trying to use each other and because it is an egocentric thing, but there's enough success for everybody oh, yeah. to go around. So, uh, utilizing someone else to level up and then carving them out does not make you a superstar. Right. It doesn't. Um, and, and, you need to learn that early on because of the fact that just like life, this is not, uh, this is not a lone wolf game. This is a team pack game and you better figure that out or you're not going to survive, especially if you transition into crew, especially above the line, like Kyle is above the line. Um, he produces, he can write, he can direct, he can do anything really as far as I know. You can edit as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he's a, he's a jack of all trades. And if you want to be successful, you better figure out how to do all that because you're just going to constantly be hitting roadblocks. Well, that was, that was kind of my thing is when I hit the roadblock, I was like, okay, well, let me learn how to do this. Let me learn how to do this part of it. So I don't hit that roadblock anymore. And then eventually I just yes. developed all the skills to needed to, to yes. make a film. And that's what I think is so cool about what you're doing too is, um, you're, instead of just depending on another director, or another producer to give you work, you're actually creating work. You're creating jobs for other people. Yes. And, um, you know, I know that you're going to run, run across those people that are trying to use you and stuff along the way. Yes. But I think that a lot of times those people just get, um, they end up being snuffed out in the end, because like you mm -hmm. said, if you want to go quick, you go alone. Yes. If you want to go far, you go together. True. So, I mean, you have your pack that you work with and you slowly like weed those people out and then eventually Absolutely. they're watching from the sidelines. Absolutely. They are. And I want to commend you, Kyle. I, I admire you quite a, a great deal because you took the mature route and, and said, Hey, I'm going to be an adult. And instead of stepping on people and utilizing them for a skill, skill set, I, I may help, let them help me through this until I learn the skill set, but I'm going to learn the skill set 
Right. Um, and, and that's the important thing to do is, uh, Stop looking for other people to solve your problems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But at the same That's time. That's a life lesson right there, too. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> But um, I, I really admire your great deal. And that's the responsible thing to do is to figure it out. And on, at the same time, though, you don't want to go so far that you're wearing so many hats because you can't wear so many hats because eventually some of them will start falling off, which I've been guilty of this. Oh, yeah, me too all the time. But I, mean, it's, and I think it's also part of growth. But at the same time, yeah, you're right. You need to learn the skills, but but also be able to learn when to give them away. Like, here, you yes. take this job, you take this job, yes. like dictate what jobs you can and can't do. So for me, I know people that are way better editors than I am, mm-hmm. but I can edit good enough to get something done. Yes. So if something needs to be done, I'll go and take it and do it. But if I can go, okay, I would, my, t- my resources would better be, um, my time would be better be used in this area. Then I'll dictate the, uh, the editing to someone else who can do it better than I can. And trust that person to do their job. You don't have to stand there and micromanage them once you hand it off. Exactly. A- and that comes back to as well. One of the huge lessons that I learned is if you have a bag, e- bad egg, you need to cut them. <laughs> don't jack around with that. If you realize someone's unhealthy, Cut them loose. See, I have, the a sooner the better. I have a problem with that. Cause like for me, even when it comes to like <laughs> managing the bar and stuff, mm-hmm. I like, I love people so much and I, and I'm, I feel like anytime a manager fires someone that it kind of reflects on them too. On them as well. Yes. Because like, why can't that person, why can't they work together? Yes. So for me, yeah. I want to hang on to that person and like try to understand them better and see if I can actually make that relationship work. And sometimes it ends up, ends up biting me in the butt. Yes, I suffer from the same thing. I want everybody to succeed. Yeah. And I think we all can. And I think we should have a more understanding heart with people. Um, Because to love somebody, you have to understand them. And you can't understand them unless you listen to them. And I'm not referring to people who are struggling and are in the midst of growth and are having growing pains. I think I'm referring more to people who are vicious and selfish Mm. and have no concern for anyone around them. Right. That's more the people that I say, if you realize you have those sorts of people, call them and the quicker, the better. Yeah, no, that's true. And, um, and, and I do, I have a lot of patience. Um, (laughs) I have a lot of patience with people probably. She laughs, a devious laugh. (laughs) (laughs) Patience. (laughs) I, uh, I try to get up every day with a fresh, it's a brand new day. (laughs) Because things do happen. I mean, none of us are perfect. But we also have to remember that the camera records both ways. It's not just recording the actor's performance. It it records the the DP's emotion and the director's emotion as I like well. That. Yeah, it's something people don't think about. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, it's a collaborative story. You're not just um you're not just filming the actors. It's everyone working together. Yeah. So you better figure out your team and you better treat them properly. And you got guys all grow together, but you, you know, how do you even know this goes back to you, Kyle, having learned the skill sets, how do you even know somebody has got the skill set if you don't know enough about it to know if they know what the hell they're doing? That's a good point. Yeah. And I got, I got caught in that trap when I first got in the industry. Mm-hmm. I did. I wound up with a two and a half hour film full of footage that wasn't labeled because I was told I brought someone on that begged to be on the project who brought on a camera operator who was new. I was willing to give him the opportunity, but I agreed to the new camera operator because the first person was going to monitor them, make sure they were doing dailies and also everything was labeled. I wound up with, um, a film that long-term, um, two and a half hours that was not labeled, not a single scene. And so for anyone who doesn't understand like, um, the film process, that's, that's a nightmare. What she just said, because yeah, it's once you go back, I mean, the amount of footage you have for a two and a half hour film is unfathomable. So the fact that it, none of it was labeled. Yeah. Crazy. It's, it's lucky it got finished and it was a six year mistake for me. Yeah. And it took a lot of committed people um, on my team who really dug the trenches. Uh, Jackson um, Pierce. There was a, a guy named Dustin. Um, and Hunter, uh, they, they really put a lot into it and helped me get it out of that situation. And mm-hmm. now I have a great film, um, that's 
going into sound correction at this point. So nice. um, this is the devil's hitching post. Devil's hitching post. Nice. Six years. Yeah. Six you guys years. Be, be on the lookout for that one right there. Yeah. That's a great baby right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was a, when I was bartending on bourbon street, the reason I, I learned, you know, all the tools of the trade was because I met a director down there and this guy directed, um, films in LA somewhere. You know, I didn't mm-hmm. talk to him much about it. Films, commercials, whatever he did. But, um, that's what he told me. He said, I'm a director. And I said, Oh, cool. I want to be a director. This is me bartending on Bourbon street. And he's like, well, my advice to you, learn everything. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay. And that's when I first, I took his advice and I was like, okay, now I'm going to start learning every, everything I can about the industry. And the best way that I did it was, um, the same thing that you did. Just kind of jumped into it. Jump in it. Yeah. Me and Adam, uh, Adam Hensley, uh, an actor. Oh yeah. He is uh, my old roommate. And I went home after I talked to that director that day, and I was like, "Hey, man, let's uh, let's make a, a web series." Cool. And he's like, "Okay, what do you want to do?" And I was like, "I don't know." So I, all I had at the time to, to film with was my drone. So I literally held my drone in my wow. hand. Wow. And we filmed the first scene of just like us, like walking into a, a warehouse. Is all it was. It was. Two guys walking into a warehouse, and we looked at each other, and we stopped. And I was like, "Okay, now we're gonna put this on Facebook, and we're gonna call it Collaborative Stories, and we're gonna ask the audience what they think should happen next." Oh, it's super cool. Yeah. So it was a cool concept. Yeah. And the way the ideas they were pitching to us, like we just let them vote every time on Facebook for the best idea. And then we would go try to make that work the next time. So what that yeah. did for me was it gave me like a new story to write, to like try to figure out how to edit every single time. The crowd was your writer. Yeah. And very wow. quickly that got insane. So I mean, it was like <laughs> this guy jumps through a portal and goes into this guy and then shoots a guy with lasers. And I was like, what the fuck? I don't know how to do this stuff. How challenging. Yeah, yeah. So I just had to like figure it out. Yeah. And that's what you have to do. People say, I want to be a filmmaker and they sit around, and they create these film co-ops and they talk about it for ages, mm-hmm. ages, and they never do anything. They never shoot anything. They just talk about it. Yeah. Now the amount of hours that I spent on YouTube yeah. looking through tutorials yeah. is insane when you start thinking about it. Yeah. Just go do it. Yeah. Just go do it and figure it out step by step. Just, just whack them all. Yeah. Well, honestly. Now a lot of the stuff that I do, um, like if I find someone who, I mean, all the skills that I picked up along the way. Now, when I find someone who needs a new logo or something like that, or just needs a new, uh, some, some help with their branding and stuff on their stuff on their, their, mm-hmm. their products or whatever they're doing, mm-hmm. I'll just jump in and help them. Superb. Yeah. And now they're like, uh, they're like, how do you know all this stuff? And I'm like, you just pick it up along the way. Those yeah. are the skills you pick up along the way. I love this about you, Kyle. This is great. Yeah. Like the other night, I think, uh, whenever you, you came to town right before you and I met up at the bar over here. Uh, there was a guy that I've been helping with his, his branding stuff and you know, call him up and I'm talking to him on the phone, talking through this editing problem that he's having as we're driving to the bar. <laughs> yeah. It's never ending, is it? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, still, it's, I, don't, I don't mind helping people when they want to grow, but that's the thing. I'm not, I don't anymore. I don't just do it for someone. Mm-hmm. Now I'll try to help them learn the skill too. That's, uh, that's so admirable. It's well, so it's admirable. Just, it's the way it should be. It should be. When anytime you like hand someone something, they take it and they go and they want more. Right. You know? But if you actually teach them the skill, then they're going to learn how to do it and they won't come back and ask you again. Absolutely. So that's, it's really a selfish way that I'm doing it because <laughs> I've learned that if I just keep, <laughs> that if I can knock it out real quick and give it to you, that's fine. You know, I get the praise and everything. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you're going to be coming back asking me for something else. So it's like, let me just teach you the skill. That way you shut the fuck up and leave me alone. And it's enabling them. You're not actually helping them as a human being if you're just doing the job for them. Right. Right. So yeah, that's pretty interesting. I I need to learn a few skill sets. Yeah, that's well, what I tell everyone. I mean, even um, it's all my all my friends. I'm like, dude, you got to learn skills. You can charge mm-hmm. for skills, or you can uh, just give them away. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, you have options. My uh, shortcoming is editing. That's my uh, personal roadblock at the moment, and I am working on that. Well, that's um, that's a, a very easy skill to learn too. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the times when people think about editing they're making it way too complicated. Right, right. Like all you need is a piece of footage with some audio on it. And then you can cut that up and move it around wherever you want to go. Yeah. And if you have a scene where there's multiple angles, you literally put the, the link, the audio up Mm -hmm. and then just cut around that right there. Bam. Yeah. So I've been in the editing room enough that, um, well, first of all, I know how to do the hard parts, which is understanding the dance of how a film should be cut, which is learning to let a film breathe the timing, the timing, the pacing. Um, and you can take the same footage and cut it in a comedic form or a horror form, 
format. Um, you know, but the thing is, so I understand all this and I understand, and I'm a writer and I'm a director. So I understand all the angles and where they should go. I saw it in my head when I wrote it. Mm -hmm. And then I saw it in real life when I shot it. But the problem is I don't understand how to run the cockpit. I have been lacking with tech skills for ages. In fact, I am ready to throw my phone out the window because the dang thing is so janky. And I sit here and I think, is it me or is it the phone? Or is we just don't have internet today? What's happening? Um, and of course my phone is messed up and I've been in Verizon three times this week. <laughs> well, so the beauty about running these editing programs is, is all you really need to know is cut. Okay. Yeah. So awesome. there, there, and there's a shortcut for that and it's C. Okay. Makes sense, right? I just learned how to edit guys. Yeah. You're a great teacher, Kyle. No, you, you hit C and it, it pulls up a knife and okay. then you cut the scene there and then okay. you hit V again and it brings you back to the pointer and then you can just move it around. So it's just like the copy shortcuts. and paste. Yeah. So, so easy. Yeah. Oh, superb. Okay. I so got this Like now. I said, I think a lot of people just, um, it's, it's the same thing we're talking about with guns. Like whenever you don't, um, have the knowledge about the subject, yeah. you're scared of it. Right. Right. And there's, and there's never anything to be scared of when you're learning about something new. It's like a Tyrannosaurus Rex up to me up to this point. Thanks for, thanks for shooting the monster, Kyle. Hey, I'll arm wrestle a Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> oh, I'm going to eat him. <laughs> <laughs> so when do you, uh, when do you think the, um, the movie's going to be, right? is this the only one you have going right now? Um, going as in going out. Or? I mean, like you have another one, another project you're working on too, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. I got two projects happening at the same time and yeah. I'm also writing. Which um, is also insane that you have two films, you know, coming, <laughs> that's the amount of work that takes and the amount of stress. Yeah. Like I would be uh, just like sleeping at home. Yeah. I have very little headspace. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm writing with very little headspace, but I have a great team. And, um, so I, and right before the pandemic hit, uh, we were about to start shooting Christmas coffee. Mm -hmm. Christmas coffee is a comedy. Uh, it's really, uh, intelligently, intelligently written, sharp, witty dialogue, uh, Canadian hockey humor. It's funny as F. Okay. And, uh, you were cast in it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Kyle is the love interest. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle's the good guy and he's trying to win his woman back. What happens? You do one sex scene with someone, they write you in as a love interest. Forever. Mm. You gotta get sick of seeing me. <laughs> so um it's really sharply written. It's witty, it's funny. Dialogue is so fast. And uh there's uh, also a young um a young man in there that's about twelve years old at this point, which you actually turned me on to him as talent. He's so good. God. He's so amazing. God, he's so good. And he was in the other project that I have going on right now. But um, so he's cast in it as a young guy and he's he's so uh, articulate and he has high pattern recognition and he's kind of outfoxing all these adults and he's in a hard spot. And he just I, I, I love this character because he just musters through everything. He's just uh, decisively pushing forward. And um, there's a typical town Karen in there. Mm -hmm. um, but it's called Christmas coffee. And so we were about to start filming that. And, uh, I met the voice actor of Scooby-Doo mm -hmm. and 87,000 other Hannah Barbera characters. And he said, Hey, would you write me this script really quickly about two guys going fishing? I said, no, but I will write you a modern day three stooges that's not so slapsticky with some fun humor um and uh and we'll see what happens but i'm not producing this film mm -hmm. under any circumstances i'm not producing this film and um so he said okay so i wrote it and and, and then covid hit mm -hmm. right and my santa who is in every single film that i ever do you're gonna love him his name is lee cannon and his name in every film is pie noel which is, uh, father Christmas basically in French. And, uh, we changed the spelling of it for every film, but he, his name is Pie Noel in every film. And so COVID hit, we were kind of uncertain and I, I care very deeply about this human being. And I said, okay, we're going to pump the brakes for just a moment because, um, I don't want to kill my Santa. Right. Just in case. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to take any chances of that. So, because it, it was, everything was very unknown at that point. And so, um, Scooby-Doo, who is Scott Ennis, said, yeah, well, I'm going to produce this other film. So since you're pumping the brakes on that, let's go hit this. And I said, well, we can shoot B-roll. Mm -hmm. 
I said, okay, I'll agree to B-roll. I'm going to go over here and get my camera operator. We're going to shoot some B-roll because we're, we show the dichotomy of uh, the beauty and the the poverty of Louisiana. I mean, the the, the it, it, of everything. It's just not, it's not just housing, but it's also the terrain. I mean, you have the most delicious food down here, but if you walk off to go get you a, a fish out of the swamp, you might get eaten by an alligator. It's kind of dangerous. Yeah. Right. But it's also beautiful at the same time. So it's just like this, you know, is a juxtapo. Is this the correct? Juxtapo, yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, I thought, well, yeah, we'll go shoot this B-roll. And, uh, this, the next thing I knew he had some, um, some well, pretty well-known actors around here, uh, that have been in a large, a lot of large films, such as a brother where out there and such. And, uh, he had them booked and he had a courtroom booked and he said, this is the only way we can get them. Let's go shoot. <laughs> I'm like, where's the pre-production? Mm-hmm. And for those of you that don't know much about pre-production, you do all the hard work is done before the film is ever shot. It's about a year's worth of intense, rigorous work. You're working 18, 20 hour days, making it all happen because you're trying to take all of these ambiguous factors such as uh, locations and 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 weather and talent. They're, they're all organic factors and you're trying to meld them all together seamlessly, pardon, seamlessly and make it look flawless and something that's viewable. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, there was no pre-production on this film. So I was up all night long writing legal paperwork for uh, location release, talent release, all, all these release forms um, so that we could uh, start filming the next morning. And we just dove head first and it kind of hijacked my life for two years, but I actually own that film. Mm-hmm. Um, it's mine and it's in the tail end stages as well. Um, it's picture locked, color locked, and now in it's walking into the sound room this week for sound correction. And it is the dumbest film on the planet. Yeah. Intentionally. <laughs> yeah, those, those are the cult classics right there. That's, that's how people make them. Yeah. We have so many, it's almost a spoofy type. We have the real smoking the bandit car in there. We have, uh, Actors from Swamp Thing. What uh, were the um, those films in the the back in the day? They were like the, about these two hunters that would go out and had these like massive guns they would take. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like it was one where they they went in like the swamp or so they were duck hunting and they they got trapped in the mud. I didn't see and they that. Had to use their gun to like breathe. <laughs> Because they had this like gun that was massive. It was like a 14 foot barrel. That's great. I'm just, see, I'm just hearing the story and I'm laughing. It brings joy to my life. And and that's really why I did that film. Yeah. I mean, that's for some reason, those films stuck in my head. So I mean, those are like the things that people. Ernest goes to camp, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, All these, all these films, especially when we're younger. And I, I built that film from, for a broad spectrum audience. It's got spoofs and, and cultural references for a seven year old all the way up to an 80 year old. And, um, it's just a broad spectrum film. There's no cuss and it's, there's some almost adult lewd humor in it that children would not catch, but it's pretty clean Mm -hmm. and it's funny and it's dumb. It is so dumb. It's, it's almost paralyzingly funny at times. Um, and don't let me ever talk it. You might not have the same humor I do. Well, you say it's got, it's got that kid in it too. What's his name? Um, uh, I shouldn't know his name. I, I shouldn't have put you on the spot like that. Either. Yeah, yeah. Arthur, Ru- I cannot pronounce his last name. It's Rusnak or Runsack or he has a, it's a beautiful name that I can't pronounce. So regardless, Arthur. if you think, if you don't find the film funny or not, you should definitely check the film out because that kid right there is going to be a star. Yeah, he will be. He will be. He's definitely amazing. Like there's someone that comes across your path every now and then you're just like, holy shit. Like this, this yes. guy's got it all. Yes. And I was looking and looking, I weeded through probably 1300 kids and Kyle said, Hey, and I thought, yeah, okay, well, it's a good thing I trust you so much because I'm just going to look at this one last child. And I, there was no, I knew right then as well, this kid is going somewhere. I remember the first day I met him. So I actually did a, I was doing a student film down here at Tulane mm-hmm. and, uh, some, another guy found him and he was on the, on the set and I went in to read with this kid and I'm like thinking, okay, I'm just going to read with this kid. You know, he's probably yeah. not on his lines or anything. He knew my lines better than <laughs> yeah. I did. And I was like, holy shit, like this is on point. Yes, he is. That Speaking of that, um, I sent him the sides for Christmas coffee. And um, the child is so articulate. These are words that I know that I can't even hardly pronounce properly, right? right. And um, But that's his character and that's the way he speaks. And uh, so I sent him two sides. 
And I said, look, you've, you've got three days to turn these sides back in at least three days. I understand if it takes you a minute. Um, and you only have to do one side. Uh, And an hour later he was off book, just basically cold readed it off book, knew it word for word, pronounced everything perfectly Mm -hmm. and was in character. And I was blown away. Yeah. It was insane. And it's not just him. Uh, while he was on, he got cast in. So the comedy, the, the dumb comedy, (laughs) the three stooge comedy is called go fishing. And so I put him in that one because we wound up shooting that one before we wound up shooting Christmas coffee, which I originally cast him in. And, um, so I wound up meeting his family and his mother is just a wonderful human being. Yeah. Easy to work with, which you that's a luxury. Oh, the mother and the father. Have you met the father too? Uh, not yet. Yeah, he's he's amazing too. Um yeah, I don't know. I was I remember the first time I met the mom, uh, I was talking to her about it and I asked her, like, you know, how is he so mature? Like I'm playing his father in this <laughs> right. film and he's more mature than I am right now. Same. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, and she's like, Same. he's just um, uh, you know, we've always talked to him. Like he's an adult. It, which is very interesting because I knew that about him by the time that I wrote go fishing. So I wrote him in as a grown adult, basically in a child's body, Mm -hmm. same thing with Christmas coffee. And he played it so immaculately well, Mm -hmm. but he's doing bizarre things such as, um, he drives a car. (laughs) (laughs) I can see him do that in real life. Yeah. Yeah. And he's always, he's a polite gentleman. He opens doors for women and Mm -hmm. smiles and he talks about unrequited love and all these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So it's, he pulls it off. He does. I mean, this, this guy's going somewhere. He's great. He's just great to work with. If you ever get the opportunity, his name is Arthur and it's R U S N A K, I believe. Um, but he's, he's an amazing utilize this guy and pay him well. He's worth it. Yeah. So where can the people find you at Jonah? Um, do you have social medias or anything <laughs> or, or do you have them for the films? So my social media life got so busy. It started uh, interfering with the work. Mm-hmm. So I decided to just do the work and let the work speak for itself. And I wound up with a couple of PR people who were tending to my social media, but I was always very personal on social media. Always. And I was very, always transparent. I try to be that whoever I am on social media is the same person I am in real life. Mm-hmm. Um, Which in this industry can sometimes be bad. It, it can. Yeah. <laughs> so if I'm not saying the right things, I just keep my mouth shut. Right. But um, I had real life, genuine interactions with all of my um, people that were on social media and all of my fans. And when I had the transition of uh, some PR people kind of taking over, they were doing a great job, but the fans realized it. Mm -hmm. And so I just said, you know what, if this, um, I mean, I was, I was honest about it. I said, the responses may be delayed and you may be getting memories or just pictures put on here from, uh, you know, someone else. But the point is, um, I just felt like it wasn't genuine enough. And also there was a huge transition on Facebook where a lot of the young people left and it just became old grouchy pants, older generation who they bring up a lot of problems, but they never have a solution to these problems, which to me is just basically bitching. Yeah, pretty much. Which I don't enjoy. Well, I left Facebook for that reason too. Oh, you you did? Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of backed away from social media a couple of years ago and um, I have more headspace and I have the time and headspace to do the things that I really should be doing. So where can people find the films though? If they, when they get the release, um, we haven't decided on distribution yet. Uh, we got to make you at least a social media so that you can start putting your, your links to your films on it. Yes, I will do that. Now there are pages for devil's hitching post and go fish, but okay. there's been no movement on them for a year or so, but that's why Right. I've been doing the work. Yeah. And I wear a lot of hats and I want to be a genuine person and very transparent. So, um, as soon as I get two film, one film is a lot. It's like having quadruplets. Two films is like taking on somebody else's quadruplets too. Yeah, well, I mean, it sounds like you're in a good spot though, because if they're both going to sound then that means they're going to be released soon. And then soon. once they get released, then you can go into the next project. I'll have an open, open film. Not, and I'm sure you have like 
you learn so many skills from doing, from producing these two. Yes. So like there, there are so many people that they talk about it all the time, like you say, but they never actually do it. Right. And you actually doing it and doing it twice. Yes. Like the amount of skills that you have built up just from that right there, the next one's going to be a breeze. Absolutely. And it'll be a breeze because, um, I'm doing it with you. Oh, well, that's going to be, yeah. <laughs> and Arthur. <laughs> yeah. And Pi Noel and, uh, Jean Calderera is, um, she was in Go Fishing. Mm-hmm. And she was cast as three different characters. There's your Easter egg. And she is the Karen, the local town Karen in Christmas coffee. So Christmas coffee is our next project that's coming up. I am writing a, a screenplay for someone who wrote a book that did really well. And they, they wanted me to produce it and direct it as well. And there's an A-lister attached to it, but I think I'm just going to write it and then delve into my own little things for a while because I enjoy working with the people I enjoy with and not, not do such a big, like tier one project. Um, and if it, if it works out down the road, great. If not, but, um, that's okay too. But a Christmas coffee is up next for me. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. That's going to be enjoyable. And I do have a great skill set. It is going to be a breeze. And I have a really tight knit community of a cast and crew that I've worked with over and over and over that this is going to be like family reunion without the negative person there. Right. You know? Yeah. No, I love it. Yeah. 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 It it, it will be Christmas. (laughs) So the, um, the other two films that they can find them on Instagram. Um, they're not on Instagram yet. They, they might be on Instagram. I'm on Instagram and didn't even know it. So, but like, uh, <laughs> devil's hitching post is on Facebook. Devil's hitching post is on Facebook. Go fishing, go fishing on Facebook is on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And I will start tending to those pages soon as, well, when, as long as people can follow them so they can see when the movie's actually released. Yes. That's the only thing. If, if anyone's seeing this right now and they want to see if the movie's released yet, you can go to those pages and see what right. it's linked to. Yeah. Right. And they'll both have different distribution methods. Um, there's been discussion as far as going with just like Amazon prime or Tubi with, mm-hmm. um, go fishing yeah, or I mean, DVDs. There's there so many outlets today yeah. that I, that's why it's best to have a page so you can link it to that way. They can just click on the link and bam, you're there. I'll get right on that, Kyle. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just, uh, yeah. But Jonah, thank you for coming in today. Thank you so much for having me. You're always enjoyable. Yeah, no, we'll have you back on sometime too. Hope I didn't talk too much. You didn't talk enough. I mean, yeah. <laughs> we could talk for all, we could talk for days. But yeah, awesome. uh, no, thank you for coming in. We'll, we'll let everyone know when the films get released. Thanks. Go get it, guys. Just do it.